Recording. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now I'm recording. So let's see if you can do it twice. Are we ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, go. Hey, this is Mukunda from yourwellnessyogi.com, and you're listening to Jeff Smith from Vroom Vroom Beer. Woo! Good job. And no Thank echo. You. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll be I'll go away for a second and I'll be right back. Yes, sir. Are you ready to thoughtfully steer away from your revved up, frenzied, and far too often scripted life? Then welcome to Vroom Vroom Veer with Jeff Smith, where he guides you down the road differently traveled by sharing unique experiences with guests who have managed to shift away from a life stuck on cruise control and veered their way into a more authentic and fulfilling one in all sorts of interesting and kind of remarkable ways. Get ready to Vroom Vroom Veer with your differently traveled road chauffeur, Jeff Smith. Robert Klink, thank you so much for being on Vroom Vroom Veer and welcome to the show. How's it going? It's good. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, this this I think is going to be fun because uh, like I told you in our, my, my, uh, our pre-show chat that I did a trademark for my logo and the name of my show and uh, it wasn't fun but I think it was worth it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, 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 it's unfortunately never fun to deal with lawyers, so I'm glad right. that you think that talking with me for, for an hour might be fun at least. That's, that's an improvement. <laughs> well, good. Good for you. You've already, you've already scored points because you're putting down lawyers, so that's great. <laughs> you have Look, to have I'm, humor when you're in the, in the lawyer game, right? I mean, I recognize, especially, you know, some of what I do is helping people plan. So that at least isn't bad. But a lot of times I'm dealing with people after they've been sued or gotten a nasty right, letter. Right, so right. I, they don't want to see me. And, and unfortunately, you know, that's my business and I have to deal with it. But uh, right, I certainly right. recognize it. Yeah. A lot of times you're you're stuck in damage control instead of what you want to be doing is setting up so there's no damage to begin with. That's absolutely right. Okay. So you are Bobby Clink and you are at clinkllc.com. So I, we know that you are obviously an intellectual property attorney, um, but talk a little bit about what you've got going on in your business these days uh, that you're most excited about. Okay. W what I'm most excited about is, so l let me back up sure. um, for listeners and kind of walk through what intellectual property is, because I'm not sure if all your listeners will know it um, okay. 100%. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But, you know, intellectual property is basically any kind of property that's um, intangible. So not something you can pick up or hold and it's not a piece of dirt. So it's uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's ideas. It's it's thoughts. Um, so this podcast really, might be intellectual property. Yes, it is. There even though I, even though we may not be intellectual on it, it'll at least be intellectual <laughs> property. Well said. <laughs> um, but, but so there, and there are kind of four classic kinds of intellectual property. One is a patent. So most people know what that is. That's right. a, 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 something that protects an invention. Um, okay. What a lot of people don't know is an invention, you know, a lot of people think of a machine, a widget, but an invention could be a method. It could be a steps for doing something. But so right. that's the first type. Uh, that's what most people focus on the most. And it's a mistake that people make to focus on that the most because it's the most expensive and it, in many ways, um, something that you're least likely to use. Mm. The, the next kind is what you mentioned, a trademark. And a trademark is something that identifies the source of a product or service. So it, it identifies who it is who's providing it. So again, you mentioned you trademark the name of the podcast. Another classic example, Coca-Cola, the name is a trademark, right. um, trademark brand. Uh, next is copyright. I think most people understand what that is. That's uh, rights and creative works like a book. Uh, again, there's copyright protection in anything that is creative once it's in a finalized form. Right. And then the final is trade secrets. And this is the one that almost nobody thinks about unless you talk to someone like me or hear someone like me prattle on on, on a podcast or some <laughs> other uh, radio show. Right. But a trade secret is essentially any confidential, valuable commercial information that is protected so long as you take reasonable steps to protect it. Okay. And I'll use Coca-Cola. Let's go back to them to use an example. Mm, right. The formula for Coca-Cola is a trade secret. Sure. And because they take steps to protect it, it stays confidential. And the reason why you would do that is that stays confidential – as long as you're able to protect it. Um, it, there's no time limit. Someone can reverse engineer it, and if they do, great, more power to them. But mm. 
otherwise that you get protection forever. So, wow. Yes. Yeah, so, I didn't know so the part about the, it's okay to copy it. <laughs> yeah. And that's, and that's the difference between a patent and a trade uh, secret. So okay. a patent, you actually, you actually have to disclose your invention fully in your patent and you get unlimited protection during the term that's set by law. And then once mm. that's over, it, anyone can use it. Then it's in public domain kind of thing. Right? Ex exactly. Whereas okay. a trade secret, on the other hand, if someone can reverse engineer it, mm -hmm. they can do it. So again, if you think about it, that's people have been trying to do that with Coke forever. I mean, you get, you know, RC Cola, so, Pepsi, yeah, we're, we're, Fanta, yeah, and, <laughs> all the other colas, basically. Yeah. And, and again, I don't even know if they tried to copy it, but you know right. that your, your knockoff generics at the store are trying to copy one or the others. But so, sure. Um, but as long as you keep it confidential, um, someone can't use it in, in the context of a small business. It's more things like a customer list, mm, uh, okay. a, a method of doing things behind the scenes. So something that's not public yet, mm, that mm, would be mm. a trade secret. Gotcha. But so I gave you that background. Now let me go back and answer the question you actually asked me. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I talk too much. No, that's great. It makes my job easier. I can just chill. <laughs> Um, so, so what I'm most excited about is, and, and I think I kind of mentioned this or started to a, a bit ago, there are two parts to my business, really. The first part is advising clients, uh, mainly entrepreneurs and newer companies on how to set up a, a strategy to deal with all these issues at the outset or, right. you know, ongoing. And the other part is litigation where someone has been sued or is about to sue someone. And so they come to me to represent them. Right. Um, what I'm most excited about is, and I'm hoping to have it done over the next 60 to 90 days, is I'm uh, developing an online course oh, cool. that will help people with kind of that first part, with the planning piece for people who still can't afford to pay an attorney. Because again, you know, I, I think I'm worthwhile. I think spending money on creating a plan is definitely a worthwhile effort, but I understand that you know, it, it's not something that everyone is either ready to do or can afford to do, especially for a small side venture. Right, but right, right, right. They still need to know the information, and they still need to take some steps. Mm. Um, and so the the idea is I'm going to create an online course. It'll be a paid course, but it'll give them the information much cheaper than they could get it by working with me. And uh, it'll also have um, – they'll get uh, kind of template forms. Like one of the things I, I stress to people is you need to have agreements with employees, with independent contractors that address mm -hmm. certain things. So there will be template forms that they can download and then use uh, for their own business. So that's what I'm most excited about right now. Sounds like fun. And I wish I had it <laughs> about two years ago. <laughs> but anyway, we'll talk a more about that later. Because uh, I did trademark my um, my logo and my the name of my show, and and like I said, I think I think I might be the only podcaster that's done that, and unless of course uh, now I'm not talking about the ones that are you know like big famous media companies that, but you know I'm just a dude. <laughs> yeah, I mean most podcasts I, I, are just a dude, you know. <laughs> I think I remember John Lee Dumas saying on EO Fire that he has trademarks, and I'm sure he does. I would expect yeah, for he does, sure. But... Yeah, well, he has to, right? Yeah, yeah. You're right, and it's you know, it's it's. I think it depends on where you're at. You know, if you're just playing around on your first, or you know, everybody does like four podcasts before they hit the one that works. <laughs> right, right. So maybe on the one that actually starts you know, garnering interest and or cash, then you want to start thinking about protecting things. Yeah. And again, yeah. so the interesting part though, honestly, is, and the, the mistake most people make with trademarks, and again, so if you have a business um, and it's how you make a living, you should, in my view, definitely trademark the For name. Sure. Oh, of course. But let's step aside from that. The bigger mistake most people make in trademarks is not actually taking the time to search and see if someone else is already using the name. That's so the true. Problem. Yeah, that's true. And, yeah. and that's the big piece I try to advise people. And that's really a simple thing. You can, you know, you can search it so many different ways, including, you know, uh, go on your website and type <laughs> www.google.com and search whatever name. It's easier now. Yeah. than it used to be. That's true. Right. And, yeah. You know, it, it, I don't know if you know that the let me Google that for you feature that, you know, you can find where you can make fun of people who ask you silly questions. Sometimes I want to send links <laughs> of that to people and just. Uh... It's hilarious. Yeah. No, I, I've, I've seen that happen, you know, with other friends that start messing around more, more just like as a learning exercise. Right. But the name of their podcast, I already know, is, is used, you know. Right. 
it's so obviously not going to work as a business. But, you know, I know they're just messing around. So there's right. really no harm in it. <laughs> right. well, and again, I mean, that's one thing. But I mean, right. I'm just telling you, people make this mistake. In business. So, right. In, in yes. business. So I, yeah. I, 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 I brew beer for fun. That's one of the things hey, I do. Hey, I used to do that. Yeah. That's but, awesome. So I, I also, yeah, I also follow the, the craft brewing industry around my where I am in Washington, D.C. Gotcha. And one of so our first craft brewery here in the district itself was called DC Brow and they had three flagship beers including one called The Citizen that was one of their three always available beers okay and then another startup company uh, brewery not actually in the district but in the first suburb out in Maryland um made news because they came out and said we're going to be called The Citizen Brewery or Citizen Brewing Company and mm-hmm. As you can imagine, DC Brow was not happy about that. Sent them a nice little letter saying, "Don't do that." Um, <laughs> luckily, they came. They were able to resolve it without any dispute, and, and Citizen okay. Brewing became Denizen Brewing. Okay, but still, I mean, they'd already spent some money on 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 building this brand because they'd gone public, mm. and so yeah, yeah, how they how they didn't think about it, I don't understand. And they clearly, I mean, it was a business; it wasn't a, a side hustle or just right, 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 right. So, anyway. No, I get it. <laughs> I mean, I, I see you see, see it all the time, right? Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, your your head is in the bucket, as they say. But that's yep. cool. You, I used to homebrew too. Do you do all grain or do you do extract? Oh, I've done all grain, um, pretty much. Uh, I mean, I, I started with extract. I think I did that, and then kind of a. Uh, I've forgotten what the the midpoint is where you do some extract and then some. Yeah, steep yeah, 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 yeah. Right. I did but that too. About, yeah, within three, two or three months, I was doing all grain. I built myself my own big, huge um, mm, uh, rig with big two by home. sixes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I started, brew, you know, making up my own recipes pretty much immediately. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think the first, my first brew was the only time I did a hundred percent from a kit. After that, it was always I was doing a bit of the recipe mm, myself. Mm. I, I've toyed with the idea of starting a brewing company, but you know, it's a, it's not an easy thing to do. There's yeah. a lot of capital requirements and time requirements yeah. which is the problem yeah yeah no it's fun to do as a hobby though yeah, I, yeah. right now my my new thing is i'm making have you ever heard of kombucha i've heard of it i've never had it or, or tried making it okay so it's basically what i do is i'm making instead of using so kombucha is typically uh, fermented tea so you take right. like two cups of sugar put it in a spaghetti pot with water And then uh, put some tea in there. You don't even have to boil it, right? So it's a lot easier than beer. Um, And then you pour a couple of those commercial bottles of of, um, kombucha in there as your starter. And then let it ferment a couple, like a week. And you've got, you know, fermented tea. Very low alcohol, right? And then you flavor it however you want to flavor it. It's a really nice beer substitute when you're trying to take a ba- break from beer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I also See, did this thing where I replaced the tea with hops. Oh, which I should that could be a billion uh, billion dollar idea because it's really yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Well, see, the, the problem is though you lost me on the. It doesn't take as much time because, quite honestly, yeah, when I, I know, think I, brewing. I know. It's the waiting. You know, yeah, it, it's the well, three no, hour it, boil day. <laughs> <laughs> but it's the that's an excuse to sit outside in my backyard and with drink, friends yeah. and drink beer. Oh, I'm so. I'm with you. <laughs> oh, it was that was the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, so let's go back in time because we have to remember we're on Vroom Vroom Veer and talk about like right. uh, where you grew up and what your childhood was like. So where did you grow up? I grew up in a town called McAllen, Texas, which okay. is um, five miles from the Mexican border, about 50 miles from the coast. So just think about Texas all the way at that kind of very southern tip part. Okay. Um, so it was a, 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 a I, I always call it a town, but even I think when I was growing up, it was about 60,000. Now it's probably you know, 150 to 200,000, and then the metro area around it is bigger. But mm. um, it was a very different experience than I think most people have experienced. Um, right there on because, the border, yeah. yeah. Right there on the border. Um, you know, I was there, and when I was growing up, it was at a time when it was just normal that you would go across the border to go shopping, to go eat. Right, um, right. There was just a lot of interaction between. Um, and my father was uh, in retail. He had uh, owned a chain of retail drug stores. Mm. But, I mean – they were drug stores, but also a lot more than drug stores. So kind of think of a, a, a nicer CVS or Dwayne Reed okay. that had good fragrances, uh, mm. really great toy selection, things like that. Gotcha. So 
And then he had one store that was big, almost the size of a Walmart, um, uh, that, but it was a different brand. But so we – he relied largely on people coming up from Mexico because a lot of people would come from Mexico to buy things that they couldn't get down there. So gotcha. a, okay. lot of, a lot of the economy there on the border is actually – um, from that, it's people coming up, buying it and then taking it down into Mexico. So right, right. It, okay. it was a very different experience, um, than I think what anybody who's at least 50 miles from the border has ever experienced. <laughs> right. No, I get it. That, now I, I grew up on a border, but it was a, a completely different kind of border. <laughs> I grew up on the Michigan, Wisconsin border. Yeah. Slightly different. Way different. <laughs> But, you know, I, I was always I was, you know, I slept in Michigan, but I could walk to Wisconsin, you know, so. Well, well, it's funny now I, I, I live in D.C., but at the end of my block, I'm in Maryland. So, you know, I'm always by borders, <laughs> I guess. That's pretty cool. So, OK, so what kind of what kind of kid were you growing up? Were you like a, a action sport hero or like a, a book <laughs> nerd? <laughs> well, I was not an action sports hero. I I always did. I mean, I was active and played sports growing up, but I think the best way to uh, sum that up. So again, I guess through junior high and my freshman year in high school, I did the typical thing down in, in where I was from. We would have football in the fall and then you would have, um, um, basketball, I I guess, started kind of about when football ended and then track. So I kind of did all three in school, which was a pretty typical thing. I wasn't very good at any of them. Um, Right. In fact, in in junior high, I will tell this story. Um, I was, there was a basketball game and we were losing horribly. I was normally a bench warmer, but I was on and I was fouled right as the game ended. And somehow the other, the opposing coach then got a technical as well. So there were four free throws to be taken. And you had to take all four. Yeah. And I missed all four. So, (laughs) Uh, yeah, (laughs) I I mean, we we were down by, it was 20 some odd points, so it didn't matter, but still it was a pretty, pretty uh, embarrassing experience. But so my, my prowess on the athletic field was summed up my freshman year in high school when, so I played, I played football and the highlight of my football career there was our, um, middle linebacker on our team ended up our sophomore year being on the varsity and then was able to walk on to the university of Texas football team. He didn't play much, but you know, he's pretty good for a small town guy. Sure. Yeah. And at one time during practice, I laid him out on a block, but that was because it was a crackback block and he saw me right as I hit him. So, um, that was the highlight of my football career. But then later that year in track, I'm trying to remember, I was, um, there was a track event and then a, um, some kind of academic competition I was in and they, they conflicted. They were on the same Saturday. So I went, I went to my coach and told him, he said, now, Bobby, I think you should go to the academic event. That's where your future is. So that, that was the end of my athletics career. Uh, <laughs> that, that statement summed it up. Well, at least he was honest about it. You know? yeah. <laughs> I mean, mind you, this was second semester of my freshman year. And by that point, unfortunately I had started smoking. So mm, you know, I, right. I didn't really have great lungs anyway. So, you know, it was not a surprise. <laughs> I couldn't run. Well, you know, I, I don't, in Texas, like football is kind of like religion, right? Yes, it is. Although, you know, where I was from, quite honestly, I mean, it, it sort of was, but not what you're thinking of. Oh, okay. Um, so as- my, my high, I mean, it was it was the dominant sport. But right. My high school, for example, before my senior year in high school, my high school, I think, had never had a winning season, mm. and so teams from my area would always kind of get knocked out in the first or second round of kind of the 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 playoffs. And, you know, the students would all go to the games, but it's not like there are some towns in Texas in, in smaller towns in, say, northwest Texas or west Texas where the entire town goes to the football game on Friday night. That's just what you do. Right. Uh, and that that was not my hometown. But, okay. um, but you know, it, it was the dominant sport. Right. A little bit less pressure than what you see yes. on Friday night lights. <laughs> yes. Yeah, just a little bit less. A little bit less. Yeah, I, I got as far as uh, as freshman – freshman football. Uh, yep. and you know, I wasn't that good. Um, and it was a lot of work, you know, yep. during the summer. I mean, I don't remember when we started, but there was like practice twice a day. Yeah. 
<laughs> so try to imagine that. Just just put it in your mind. So when yeah. we would go back to practice was in August. And right. in, ugh, in, ugh. in my hometown in August, it's 100 degrees. Right, right. right. You, you, so, you, you got to want to be there, you know? Yeah. And yeah, you, and it's no fun to do that, do all of that work and then not even play. Yeah. And, and the right. funny thing is, so my, my freshman year, we had like, so our colors were, were gold and blue. We had a gold team and a blue team. So we okay. had two teams um, because we had so many kids. Mm. And I made the, 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 the top team, but I didn't actually ever get to play on offense or defense. The only reason I made the top team is I was the only guy who was willing to hold the ball for the kicker and not let go. <laughs> that was... <laughs> That was my prowess. <laughs> That's a pretty good gig, though. Yep, yep. It means you Although got to got, play every game, maybe. Well, I, the problem was, eventually the line didn't do very, do very good, so we kept getting kicks blocked, so then they just quit <laughs> kicking. Kick, so. Quit kicking altogether. Yeah, there's, it's weird. Not a lot of high school teams kick. Yep. It's, yep. A lot of, it's a lot harder than they make it, the pros make it look. Yep, it is. <laughs> okay, so we, I think we've covered childhood and high school. Yep. So now tell us, now you said you went to Harvard. It says, I, on, yeah. So how did, yeah, did that, that for, happen? Oh, I wait. did that for law school, but, but let me do. Let yeah. Me you have to do thing. your undergrad stuff first. Right. Yeah. So first of all, what you need to understand is in high school, after I made the shift to academic, I was okay. a very high performing academic, uh, in academic okay. competition. So I went mm. to, um, I started doing high school debate my senior year. I won the state title in high school debate. Uh, I did mock trial, which is where you pretend to be lawyers and witnesses and do these competitions and junior wow. year and senior year, my teams did, got to the state semifinal. So I was very involved in all of these academic things, mm. but I also was not what you expected when you looked at it. I had a very long ponytail with my hair, but then kind of shaved up on the sides and the back. Um, did not look, you know, look, look you like someone. Look lawyer -y. Right. No, I did not. I did not. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, so I did those things, had played in a band in high school a little bit with my brother, but it was just kind of messing around. Mm. Um, and then I went to the university of Texas for my undergrad and that was, my parents had both, um, both gone there. My dad had, for anybody who watches sports and watches University of Texas or has watched University of Texas, you've seen that we have a mascot, which is an actual live Texas Longhorn, you know. Right. I've seen that steer. guy, yeah. yeah. And so my dad, when he was there, was one of the people on the Silver Spurs who actually watched the Longhorn, which is this big honor to get. So I was raised from an early age that I was going to Texas was kind of the 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 assumption right, and okay. started watching their game. So I went there um, and I started out in a um, double major in engineering and a human honors humanities program. And then I said, wait a minute, I want to be a lawyer. That's going to take five years and four years of summer school. Uh, or I could get rid of this double major, just do two kind of humanities type of majors and I could do it in three years. So I changed over pretty quickly. Good idea. Uh, <laughs> Cause yeah. engineering is a lot of work in, in, well, in undergrad. Uh, yeah. yeah. Although ironically, now that I'm an intellectual property lawyer, it would have been helpful if I had an engineering degree, but that's, a, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but the funny thing is I, I get to college and I basically quit doing any kind of extracurricular activities. And then I, I played in a band with my brother was actually my, that was I guess a you would fun thing it. to do. Huh? Yeah, it was my fun thing to do. And I mean, my brother is still, he's hes a year and a half older than me. He's still actually trying, I, I don't know if he really would say he's trying to make a living at it, but he still plays. He has mm -hmm. a band in Austin that has gone through many iterations. He'll go to Europe and, you know, stay there for a month, uh, essentially make enough money to pay for the trip, to pay all their expenses and come back with a couple hundred bucks in their pocket, which, mm. you know, he, he loves doing, but it was a very different experience. Um, so that was my college, which was just a lot of fun, right. but not not the typical thing of a kid who goes to Harvard Law School. Right, um, right. Yeah. So, so that's that's. there's got to be an interesting story about how you worked that out. Did you do some well, internships or something? No, I just, I, I did well in school and, and law school especially, and I think it still is this way, but you know, back then it, it largely was test driven. So there's kind of a, a standardized oh, okay. test like the SAT or ACT, but for people who want to go to law school and okay. I did, I did quite well. And that was essentially what got me in. Um, and so I got in and, um, I, I went up there and it was this, it was a very strange experience. That is, Yeah. And, I was going to say like going from Texas to 
Harvard is like yeah. weird. <laughs> well, <laughs> culture well, shock. Weird. I mean, that's weird, but it's it's separately weird because I am. I mean, I did college in three years, so I'm a year younger than the typical person who's graduated from college, even. Right. But also. I, you know, I, I went to public school. I went to public high school, went to a public university, was not a prep school kid, was not a, you know, fancy university kid. You Just didn't that sound was... like Thurston Howell III, in other words. No, no, you know, and I didn't have a name. I didn't have a name like Thurston Howell III either. So. <laughs> Roger, um, gotcha. But so, so I go up there, and the only way to compare it was, um, and again, I don't know if you, have you seen Legally Blonde? Wow, have I seen Legally Blonde? Uh, no, I'm going to say no, because okay, I, well, I, yeah, <laughs> I don't yeah, think I mean, I look, a lot of people have it. And, you know, it's this it's this ridiculous story of this, you know, ditzy girl who gets into Harvard Law School and goes. But oh, gotcha. You know, 90 percent of it is, you know, or 95 or 98 percent of it is just, you know, silly. And you look at it and you're like, this is ridiculous. Well, mm. for me, having gone there, though, there was one part that rang true, which is when she first gets in, she sits in this small group of kind of an advising group, um, sitting around a quad talking as they first get there. And, you know, they're going around the room talk or going around the circle talking about what someone did. So, Oh, I have a PhD in this. And someone, Oh, I have a road scholar. And, and, you know, it's just, you go through this and they're all ridiculously qualified people. And then she comes and she just has a, like, I think her degree was in something silly like fashion design, but you know, she just has an undergrad degree. (laughs) Right. Well, that was kind of my experience. So I get there and everybody there is so interesting. They've, you know, lived abroad. They've, right. they've done some amazing scholarship. They have a master's degree. They're, mm. they're partway into a PhD. And then there's just me, this, you know, 21 year old kid who went to the University of Texas and has a, a, a degree in the humanities. So um, it, it was a, a, an interesting experience uh, to get there. But then pretty quickly it just became school again. And, and right. I just enjoyed it and had fun with yeah, school. Yeah. yeah. Nice. What was it like hanging out in Harvard? What was that? What was that? Well, <laughs> was it a party experience or were you just pretty serious about studying? <laughs> well, <laughs> or a little of both? <laughs> well, see, I, I laughed because um, there was a term that we all came up with, which was Harvard cool. So, ah, you know, there, okay. were, there were gotcha. people at our law school who were cool at our law school. But let's be clear. Most of us are, you know, the people who fell in that group probably were not cool anywhere else. But, you know, <laughs> among this group of people, sure, you know, they were the cool kids. All right. Right. Um, right. Right. Gotcha. But, you no, know, there was there was a lot of socialization. There was um, you know, they do a thing called bar review, which um, it was actually you go to a bar. It was like every Thursday night and, you know, spend time with people and, and you made a lot of friends. You also had a lot of work. But it, like I said, it just became school. My my now wife, who was a girlfriend at the time, was there with me. So that mm. made my experience slightly different um, than the folks who are you know, just there by themselves. Right. But it was, okay. it was also different in other ways because my wife was working. And so she made friends with locals. So we actually spent time with some of the local you know, Boston and, and people from that area rather than – all of the the students who were from really all over. So right. uh, it was a, it was a fun experience, but um, we um, a lot of it was in fact working and you know and, and studying and learning and your trying job. To, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you keep doing? Did you were you in a band or did you let that go? Uh, I let that go. Gotcha. Um, and I cut my hair. I looked more like a normal, respectable person by the time I had gotten there. Gotcha. And you know that was one of the things that I and I don't. I don't have crazy hair or playing a band now, but one of the mistakes that I, I looking back that I made was early on is I felt a need to try to be lawyer man, you know, fit into the role of what people <laughs> expect of a lawyer. Sure, sure, sure. Um, whereas, you know, now I don't do that. I mean, if, if people don't want to hire me because I'm in jeans and, and a button up shirt rather than a suit, well, fine. I mean, that's okay. Um, right. You know, right, right. that's not that's not who I am. And sure. so I'm not going to pretend that that's who I am anymore. Good for you. Yeah, it takes a long time to. I think you have to play the part for a while to yeah. learn what's going on. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I, think, I think that's right. I mean, there yeah. there are some law firms that are uh, that are out there that um, have just ditched it all together, and so people who go to those firms from the beginning are understanding, or I say understanding. I mean, they're wearing shorts and whatever they want, but mm. but yeah, I mean, there is some sense of that of hey, I'm going to try to play the part that I'm supposed to play. Mm. Uh, and, you know, but it wasn't just in my job. It was in other things I found, you know, at some point I discovered I had, you know, kind of, I don't want to say given up, but, um, you know, a lot of people who knew me 
wouldn't even have known me because they knew kind of a fake version of me where I was trying to be this a more traditional, more straight laced guy than I actually am. Mm. I think we all go through that when we're young because yep. we don't really, we're still trying to figure out who it is that we are, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I think that's right. Yeah. 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 Okay. So you do well, you, you get your law degree, you pass the bar and now you got to get a job. Yep. Well, so, actually, <laughs> okay. So already, so I'll back the up. Strange thing was, the strange thing was back then you actually already had a job. Um, Interesting. Because back then, um, there's a couple of things. One, one of the things you can do is work for a judge right after law school. But those were uh, – so for the federal court judges, those decisions were made in the middle of your second year in law school. Oh, you're, wow. You're okay. In law school for three years. But so basically after – you know, a year to a year and a half in law school, you will already line that up. And I did. I had lined up a, a job working for a, a federal court of appeals judge down in Arkansas uh, by the name of uh, Judge Richard Arnold, who was um, a legal luminary on the left. He was um, one of, I would say, I think most people would agree, he was one of the more prominent liberal judges never to make it on the Supreme Court. And, and Clinton actually considered him twice mm. for two of the openings of appointing him wow. decided, yeah, he decided not to because of health concerns and he's proven right. I mean, he's proven right because judge Arnold passed away. Hmm, it's been more than 10 years ago, okay. 10 to 12 years ago. Right, so right, right. Uh, so he, also, had, he I mean, definitely had the chops, but oh, yeah, he was, never worked out. Yeah. I mean, he was a brilliant man. He had graduated number one in his class from Yale undergrad and number one in his class from Harvard law school Wow, w- where he had gone to school with people like Justice Scalia, who mm-hmm. uh, most of your listeners will have heard of. And so yeah. he beat him out, beat a lot of uh, these other luminaries out. And he was also the nicest man in the world. He had a policy. If someone called the office and said, I want to talk to the judge, we were to put them through. We were not to ask who it was. We were to put them through to talk to the judge. And so you think about it. There aren't a lot of people who are judges who would do those things. I mean, there right, are a lot of lawyers. Just calls. Who would do that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, so he did that. He was he was a wonderful man, a wonderful person to clerk for and to work for. Um, but um, so that was a year of my life that was in Arkansas. It was it was hilarious. A lot of people joked when I was up in law school, say, "Oh, do people actually wear shoes down there?" And, <laughs> <laughs> I hear that one too because I, I I grew up in a place called Menominee, Michigan, and it's very yeah. very uh, northern version of Arkansas. <laughs> yeah. I mean, right, I get it. I, I, I mean, I was from Texas, so I'm like, okay, come on, it can't be that bad. It can't be that I'm, different, right? I yeah. get. I mean, yeah. it is funny. There are there are there are subtle differences, but um, you know, it was, it was enjoyable. Um, went down there, and luckily, one of the other uh, new lawyers working for the judge had gone to the University of Arkansas Law School. So he knew all the new lawyers in town. And so, again, I had this in to automatically have a social life, um, to make friends and to have a good time. And nice. uh, so that that was quite a good experience. So that was just one year of my life. Uh, and again, so now let, let's follow this. My now wife, she had um, she grew up in the same town, right near me where mm-hmm. we grew up, had followed me to Austin for undergrad. So that wasn't too bad. Right. Had followed me to Austin. Again, not too bad. Mm. Now she has to follow me to Little Rock, Arkansas. Yikes. And she did. <laughs> Good uh, for her. Yeah. Wow. Right. You um, got to keep her. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so, so we did that for a year. And then I went, uh, came to Washington, D.C. and uh, joined a big, huge law firm of, I don't know, uh, it was probably about 1,500 lawyers total ac- across wow. the country. Holy cow. Uh, so that that was my next step along the way, and and that was where I started really fitting into this be lawyer man and and, and be straight laced and <laughs> wear a suit every um, day, and it's got to be very shiny and and yeah, it's yeah. almost like so a that, lawyer uniform at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. And, and you know, it was um, it's that, but it's also in in how you deal with clients and and you know all these things. So it was it was fun. It was fine. I, I learned. I learned from it, but I, I was chafing almost immediately. Um, at, at the time, I thought what I was chafing against was the lack of like responsibility of tasks, meaning I thought I wanted to be out doing specific these tasks, these tasks, these tasks. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so that was the problem. And, and at these big law firms, you don't. I mean, the big law firms, it'll often take you five, six years before you get to do a lot of the, the, the fun more stuff. fun tasks. Right, yeah, and, right. And, so again, now ironically, now it's stuff that I'm like I don't think it's fun anymore. I don't want to have to. <laughs> I don't want to have to jump on a plane and go, you know, question, you know, ask yeah. witnesses questions. I'd but rather, when you've you never know. done it before and you've been stuck exactly. in a basement looking through piles and boxes <laughs> of papers, right? <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. 
Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> what I figured out since is what I really wasn't, I wasn't really chafing about that. It was more the entrepreneurial spirit um, mm, because right. I got that from my dad and I was really just, you know, so I was an employee of a big corporation at that point and right. that I've discovered didn't actually fit me. Yeah, it's not, uh, you know, I guess what I would say is, because uh, I was in the military 20 years, and I know exactly what you're talking about, because corporations were, they, they were made by the military. They're, <laughs> they're very similar. It's strange yep. and weird. Yep. But yeah, you just feel like the cog in the machine kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, yep, exactly. Right. And, and, you know, at some point that just stopped being um, enjoyable. And again, it was, you, you know, learn a, a lot, thing. though. You learn a lot. You learn a lot you about you know, structure and, uh, you know, and like stay in your lane and how not to piss people off too bad. And, you know, about just moving around and surviving in that, in that culture, I think is valuable, you know, yep. and you learn a lot of skills. You, you, yep. you build up some chops. It's not like the end of the world. It's just not forever. Right. <laughs> right. Well, and, and it's, and again, there's some people for, it's fine for them. I mean, there's right. some people who, who are fine with it for me, for my personality, it just wasn't going to fit because, right. I was never someone, uh, you know, who, who fit in. And again, it's it's not a it's not a value judgment. But my one of my aunts, and this goes back to to college. One of my aunts, again, remember, I have this really weird haircut. I'm playing in a punk rock band, <laughs> and my Love my aunt's like, "You're not going to pledge to fraternity?" I said, "No." Nope. <laughs> um, wow. And again, it was just a different mindset. And again, mm -hmm. nothing. I don't make any judgments about anybody who's different than me, mm -hmm. but. I was just not someone who was made, um, I think to just kind of fit in and just go and, and, and go into an existing structure and, right, uh, right. deal with, it. I was always someone yeah. who was bucking that trend. Yeah. I went through that when I was, uh, like, uh, oh man, elementary school. I can't remember whatever year they tried to, uh, my mom and brother and family members thought it would be a good idea to send me to boy scouts. Cub Scouts? Mm. Cub Scouts. Okay. So uh, I was in my brother, my big brother's uh, hand-me-down Cub Scout shirt. <laughs> and and I was like, ah, uh, well, you know, I'll go, but I don't think I'm going to like it. You know, <laughs> just yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, yeah. and however old I was, you know, I was like, it seems very much like work to me, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a kid and I don't want to work. And yeah. uh, so I went in there and they were like, okay, um, it's your first day, so here's what you got to do by next week. And you got to read this, you got to memorize this, you got to do this, and you got. And I'm like, thanks, but I'm not doing any of that. <laughs> and I never went back. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I know what you're. I know what you're talking about. Sometimes, yeah. whatever it is inside of you knows more than you do. <laughs> At yeah, a very I, early age, what's right yeah, for that, you? Yeah. I think that's absolutely right. And again, look, there are some people who you know who thrive and flourish in that environment. Right. And, and those are the folks who, who end up being kind of make it to the top. And, um, you know, like I said, I, I've got a lot of friends who are still at that law firm who are now partners and sure. they've been there and, and look, they've, uh, they have been financially comfortable for their entire career because they were at this big law firm that paid them, has paid them a wonderful salary the whole time. Um, and so you, again, it's for it's some right. people, it's great. Right. You right. Know, it's just, just it wasn't, wasn't for great. you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So you stay there, what, like five years? Is that what you said? <laughs> no, I stayed there uh, a little over, or not even a year and a half at the ah, Beagle. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, okay. Th then I went to a, a slight or a smaller firm, but still, well, it was a 50 person firm, 50 lawyer firm. Okay. Um, that at the time had a different mindset of getting people experience from, um, the beginning, um, and actually the, the person who I interviewed with who really convinced me to go there and who I worked with when I first joined the firm was uh, none other than now Judge Neil Gorsuch, maybe soon to be Justice Neil Gorsuch. Wow. Um, but yeah, so I mean, that, that was fantastic, and he was wonderful to work for. Um, and, and he, within like a month or two of me being at the firm, had me down um, with general counsel, so in-house lawyers at a big, huge client interviewing potential witnesses, just me. So uh, I was getting the tasks I wanted. Um, and then another partner I worked with later, um, I mentioned the going out and questioning witnesses and what's called a deposition. So it's sure. kind of like it's trial testimony, but before trial. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> the first time I ever did that uh, was with another partner at that law firm. And it was, I think there were going to be a series of three or four days of depositions back to back. 
And so we went down. He took the first day I watched. The second day, I'm taking the deposition. So this is the first time I've ever done it. Had never even watched one until the day before. <laughs> and I think like 15 minutes in, he puts a post-it on like on whatever I'm I'm looking at. And I was thinking, oh, crap, I've screwed up. <laughs> okay, right. And then I looked down. It actually says, doing great. I'm stepping out. And that was it. And he was gone. Uh-huh. So that was the so that was the extent of my supervision. Um, he later said he had no idea. I, you know, had never like sat in on a deposition until the day before. Right. But that that was how that firm operated. So it, it was actually quite enjoyable. Um, and I got to work on great cases. The problem was they were a victim of their own success. They um, had started, I think, I don't know, let's say. I think the firm was maybe 10 year old, 10 years old when I joined it. Mm -hmm. And they were really at that point starting to get a huge reputation. And so it tended to be that the cases they were involved in were huge cases. And that sounds like that's awesome. The the problem is if you're (laughs) at a big company and you have hundreds of millions of dollars at stake, you're going to say the people are going to be trying my case. They better have tried a case before. So it kind of creates a problem for the young lawyers. It's it's hard to get your first experience. Um, mm, right, and, right, right. That makes sense. Yeah. So, but I stayed there for about three years. Um, enjoyed it the whole time. Got to work with just some brilliant people. Uh, got to learn a lot. And you're and doing got, some of those tasks that you wanted to be doing. Yeah, yeah. So I'm doing the some of the work. If you look at the nitty gritty work I wanted to do, my problem was just looking, saying, well, ten years from now, am I going to be successful? And I was I was having some concern. So then I did um, what for people outside of law would seem like a huge shift. Um, it's a big but, veer on this. Show. Yeah, it's a big veer. It's a big veer. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, but a lot of people in law and from this experience will immediately understand that it's it, it's a pretty common um, veer that people make, which is I went and became a federal prosecutor. Um, oh wow. So again, I shift from doing these big $100 million corporate civil cases to prosecuting criminals um, and, and putting criminals behind bars is what I did. And, and wow. I moved to, to Fort Worth, Texas. Again, it's an, yet another place I made my wife move, and she is a, an angel and a saint for doing it. Um, right. Wow. But So we go to Fort Worth, Texas uh, to do that. And, and, and the reason why you do that is it gives you the standing up in court experience that's hard to get. In civil practice, right? Okay, um, because you hadn't had a whole lot of court time at that point. No, no. I mean, right. you know, hadn't had court time. Had definitely never tried a case. Hadn't done any of those things. So mm. it gave me a chance to do that, and it was, as it turned out, as a blessing in disguise. Uh, mind you, my one of my references was uh, Judge Gorsuch. He was then a judge by that point, so he had um, referred me and recommended me to get the job. So. Um, that it, it was great. Yeah, it, it helped. I mean, it, it helped I, you know, because unfortunately, I think by that time, the judge I had worked for had passed away. And that's kind of a natural thing is you have the judge who you work for is kind of one of your advocates throughout your career and right. will recommend you to stuff. So I didn't have that. But luckily, I had another judge uh, in my pocket who who thought highly of me. Good. Um, yeah. But so I did that. And I mean, there is no question I will never have stories that are better than my time as a prosecutor just because (laughs) (laughs) some of the stuff you deal with is just just absolutely insane, including I prosecuted uh, a guy who was caught trying to smuggle cocaine um, out of the Dallas-Fort Worth airport. Um, and it was, some of it was in Idaho and mashed potatoes containers, which I'm like, okay, fine. The other was in poppycock containers. You, you can imagine that made for some good, um, <laughs> puns during a closing <laughs> argument. Wow. <laughs> I, I believe, I believe I said at some point during my closing argument, something along the, cause he actually testified and had some explanation. I think I said his, his story is poppycock. So <laughs> That's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like he teed it up for you to get a good yeah, exactly. win. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it was it was funny and it was um, but again, it was, it was a great time. And, and actually, so people um, from big corporate law firms, they actually often will try to do this, but they try to get jobs in more um, a, a more a place you've heard of. So they try to go to New York or they'll try to go to 
uh, Miami or Chicago or the West Coast offices. Where those Not big a lot cases of, that are public kind of happen, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's also they just think of those. I, I mean, I think it's also cultural. So, and okay. by culture, I, I don't mean. Um, I mean, the culture of those offices is that they expect they're going to have a lot of people coming from these corporate law firms who are going to be there for three to four, five years and then are going to leave. Mm -hmm. And that's just a normal practice and they expect it and understand it. Okay. Um, so a lot of people don't go to what a lot of people would call to call flyover country. And <laughs> understood. <laughs> ironically, it's a huge mistake if what you're trying to do is get stand up court experience because the typical person who goes to uh, the Southern district of New York, for example, they won't actually get to try a case for two to three years, probably just because it takes a while. I mean, they'll sit with someone and they'll maybe work on these big investigations, but it takes a while before you actually get to the point of um, handling the case. Well, mm. I, I was trying cases within months. Uh, wow. I tried a, a 11 or 12 cases over a three-year period, argued a bunch of cases uh, to the Court of Appeals down there, stood before these judges and hearings all the time separately. And, and part of that was that every other prosecutor in that office had been a prosecutor somewhere else before, and they really didn't want to try cases. So they were happy to hand me a file a week before trial and say, here, you want to try this? I'd say, sure. Because <laughs> that's what you're looking for. Right. All right. right. That's so, perfect. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it was, um, you know, perfect fit. It worked. But it was also a lot of fun. I mean, and, and uh, there is something, too, and, and this may sound cheesy, but getting up to – getting up in court and say, you know, my name is, is Robert Klink. I'm, I'm here on behalf of the United States of America. There's something about that that's pretty cool. And, yeah, um, I'm with you. Yes. Yeah, so it was a fun experience, and I did that uh, for three years. And again, although my wife is a, is an angel for following me around the country, I would say she also made great friends everywhere we went, and uh, was always then sad to leave. Of so, course, yeah. You know, it was, it was a good time that we spent in, in Fort Worth, and we, it actually <laughs> it, it was timed well. We sold our house in Washington D.C. in 2007, so right before the crash, we Perfect. got out. Yeah, perfect. And we bought a much lower priced house down in Fort Worth, which we lost some money on, but it was yeah. a much lower starting point, so not right. as big a hit. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you would have had a steep cliff there in DC, that's for sure. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Ouch. Okay. So now are we at the you start a business after this or is there another job in between? <laughs> Well, there is a, a, a one slight – there's another job. Okay. Um, it is um, a, a different kind of job. So I, when I was leaving the prosecutor's office, I had an offer to go back to the firm where I had been. But I also went and just typed in my went, – went to the Googles again and typed <laughs> in – I think I said Washington, D.C. litigation boutique. And I said, well, what, well, let's see what comes up. And I kind of go through, go through, and I find a couple of places. Most of them I'd heard of and – really kind of seemed about the same. There was no real difference. Mm. But I found this small little firm with three lawyers. I said, wow, this sounds interesting. And so I I sent them an email out of the blue, did not know either of them. I was able to find one guy that I knew who knew of, or I guess had gone to law school with one of them. So I was okay. able to get some information, but didn't know any, didn't know them. And for some crazy reason, they responded. Um, and we talked and it was a, a firm that had only been around two years, uh, I think at the time, a year and a half to two years, very entrepreneurial. They were doing a mix of these big, huge cases, but often on a contingency fee. Okay. So they didn't yet have uh, any steady revenue. Wow. So they said, well, you know, if you <laughs> want to come and join us and, and join us for the ride, you know, we can do it. And you know, I um, considered it and ultimately decided to go there rather than go back to an established firm. And that that I think is really the big veer. That's a uh, huge veer. I mean, that was a huge veer. I, I had a letter from them that essentially said, and again, I don't remember what the salary was, um, but I had a, a certain salary. I was called a partner, but I was not a partner. I was not in the partnership agreement, which is a, a typical thing in law firms. You'll have what are called non-equity partners. Uh -huh. It's really just a title so that they can justify that if they do bill for you, that, um, you know, you're billed at a higher rate. Um, Interesting. but wow. Yeah. yeah but so I, I, I did that, but the letter said you're entitled to this, but that I recognized the firm didn't have any, you know, um, a steady cash flow, and I would only get paid when the firm had money. Right. <laughs> so it was yeah. definitely a performance situation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, and, and so again, what I say is that, but in joining them, I made one, uh, made a huge mistake that I see a lot of entrepreneurs make. 
um, in that we didn't set out how it was that I would ultimately become a partner and didn't have a written agreement about that. Mm, So there was no process built in for how that was going to happen. Um, but so I went there and I mean, things were, you know, other than the first year, not having a lot of money because the firm didn't have a lot of money. Right. Uh, but it was great. I mean, we largely split things pretty evenly. There were two partners and then one, uh, attorney who would just basically work on an hourly basis and get paid a, an hourly rate. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, the other two partners, the real partners and I, would split things, they would get a little bit more than me, but not a lot. And so okay. that's how things worked for, hmm, I want to say probably three years Okay. Uh, without problems. Meanwhile, I mentioned my wife. She's now my wife, but we were not married for a long time. We, we finally did get married um, once we were back here in Washington and, and okay. I was working at that firm. Got married in the Bahamas. Uh, nice. which was, it was, uh, unfortunately, however, uh, hurricane Sandy interrupted our wedding. Oops. Um, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> one of my, one of the partners was able to make it. He literally flew like on the last flight in, it was like this little 10 person commuter plane and he flew through it. I mean, it was already a tropical storm at that wow. point to, to my wedding. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so, holy cow. I mean, yeah. That was commitment. So, I mean, that gives you right. sense. I mean, we, you know, we were, uh, you know, friends and everything was working great. Yeah. Um, and we're working on just, you know, these fantastic, uh, in fantastically interesting cases. They were mainly uh, competition lawyers is what they did. Okay. But they, they had this little patent case that they had gotten somehow before I joined the firm. But all of a sudden, right after I joined the firm, it, it got active again. They didn't really know anything about a patent case or intellectual property. I didn't really know about the competition law they were working on. So they just handed that case to me and I took it and ran with it. So that was the start of my intellectual property practice. Gotcha. And that's been about seven years now um, wow. that I've done that almost exclusively. But so it was fun. You know, it was, it was David versus Goliath kind of thing. That first case, it was me versus probably 12 lawyers at one of the biggest firms in the country just going back and forth and um, you know, the, the type of thing that a lot of lawyers look at and say, oh, that'd be a lot of fun. Mm, um, gotcha. But so we did that. And then my wife got pregnant after I'd been at the firm for about three years. And at that point, I went to him and said, hey, we need to talk about formalizing, making me, you know, an actual partner. Yeah, because I need money. <laughs> well, it, it, it wasn't even that. Because like I said, okay. we'd always split things evenly. All right. The, pro- the problem was that under the agreement that we had, theoretically, we didn't. They didn't have to split things evenly with me, and I had all the downside risk. If the firm doesn't make money, I'm not getting paid. Uh, but I don't right. have the upside risk. I mean, if we hit one of these huge contingency fee cases, there was no guarantee that I was going to get anything or anything above what I was entitled to. Again, right. you know, they treated me fairly, but I just said, "Hey, we need to put get it in writing." Right. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, the process of trying to do that is what ultimately made me leave the firm. Of course. Because, I've heard this story before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why I said it is a classic story yeah. that I tell so many people, you know, you need to have this in writing from the outset. Right. Because the problem was it became clear. And really, so part of the problem was even they had to figure out what their views were. And I think the two lawyers d- had different views of where I should be, mm, of right, part right. I should get. But the problem was they were both 50-50 so at the time. So neither one of them could overrule the other. So they had to get on the same page and then come with something to me. And so we had talked about it. Um, And so I was on, I guess, paternity leave, you could call it. Right. Around Christmas and New Year's. Again, that's usually a slow time for lawyers anyway. And so we talked about it. I'm pretty sure I remember talking about it like on um, New Year's Eve, just talking on the phone with – one or both of the partners. And again, I had kind of expressed it's, you know, what I had expressed to them was something along the lines of say, Hey, I understand you guys each get a premium. And what I'd rather do though, is figure out a way so that we're as close as possible for cases coming in today. Not, not old stuff. I'll give you as much as you want of the old stuff. Meaning tell me what I need to get, what small percentage I get versus you, um, to make us as even as possible and not even, but as even as possible going forward. And he kind of mulled that over and said, oh, okay, that's interesting. And so then nothing happened for a couple of months. And then um, w- one of the partners lived somewhere else. He was in town for um, for something work-related uh, on um, – it would have been the end of February. 
Okay. So, and I was giving him a ride to the airport. And so we're walking from the office to my car and we started to, he, he kind of brought it up and I could tell he, he, he knew it was not going to go over well, what he was going to tell me. <laughs> and so, right. And, and sitting here today, I have no memory of what it was that their proposal was. I, you know, I don't remember. I remember it was such that it made my jaw drop, um, you know, because I felt like it was uh, partly I didn't feel it was it was fair. But also I had been the admin partner, so I'd been handling all the finances for the prior year. So I knew I could translate in my mind what it would have meant in the year before. And it would have been it would have been very, not not good the year before. <laughs> uh, OK, <laughs> so. So, I mean, we kind of talk about it um, and, you know, uh, as we're driving and uh, we're having discussion and um, I'm pretty sure this is the guy. This is not the guy who flew through the hurricane, by the way. But I also <laughs> this is the guy who I think would have given me more. Pretty interesting. Clear. He wow. would have agreed. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, but so we're talking and part of the problem was he would make an argument or make a, a reason why. And I would say, well, how does that apply to so and so? Meaning because it just, you know, you couldn't. You couldn't match up the argument for why I was getting a small percentage versus uh, the situation. Or so I thought. Again, I don't know who's wrong or right. Um, really, nobody's wrong or right. Just we had different views. Right. Um, right, right. So I, well. I, I drop him off the airport, call my wife. She can tell I'm seething. <laughs> she says, uh, I need you to come home right now. Uh, and I said, why? She, uh, I need you. You, you, don't, you don't. I mean, she was basically giving me an excuse to not go to the office. Mm. Um and so I did. I went home. That was a Friday. Um, that that night, I registered clinkllc.com domain name, um, and I filed paperwork to to form a corporation. Just because I was like, I don't know what's going to happen, but I want to be ready just in case. Gotcha. Uh, okay. By the next day, I was not. I was you know not in a good place about it. But I said, you know, me sitting here and you know stewing about it, it's not helping. Why don't I try to get him on the phone? And so I, you know, emailed him and I said, yeah, let's talk tomorrow. Um, so the next day we get on the phone and again, you've probably heard this story many times before. The problem is at that point, each party is trying to justify why they are entitled to more. And right. the problem is <laughs> when you're talking about three people, the only way I get more is if you get less. Right. So yeah. part of the way to explain why I'm entitled to more is often – why you're not entitled to as much. And um, th the conversation just didn't go well. Um, and it was clear to me essentially when I got off that phone that my time at that firm was over. Um, my wife, my two-month-old baby, and my brother-in-law literally left right after I got off the phone, went up to my office, got all my personal effects, and left the key um, because I pretty much knew. We, we talked a bit over the next two or three days, but I knew that was the end. Yeah, um, we're done. Gotcha. Yep. And so that's when I launched Clink LLC uh, at that point in my career with no clients, with no office and not exactly sure what the heck I was going to do. <laughs> and how long ago was that? Uh, three years now. Three years. Uh, nice. Yeah. Yep. Well, you're so, still around. I'm still around. <laughs> um, you know, at, at first I also then once I was out on my own. So again, let me go back. The story that I would I, I would hope or the, the lesson that your listeners should get out of that is. Get it in writing and whatever it is, whatever agreement you yeah, want to have, get true. it in writing at the outset because the outset is the perfect time to do it. Right. Um, and it just makes sure that you'll actually all be on the same page. Don't you wish you could have taken your own advice, right? Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, and again, <laughs> I mean, the problem is – so let me back up. I mean it, yeah. it fractured those relationships aside right, from everything right, else. Right, I mean, right, right. With this guy who flew through a, through a tropical storm to get to my wedding. Right. I mean, think about that. That is yeah. not a good thing. And, and, you know, it happens to way too many people. Right. Um, but so that's I tell that story to, to people to try to help them understand you should get it in writing and yeah. get it in right today. Uh, you yeah. know, yesterday would have been better, but today's better than tomorrow. I don't know how uh, how how you are about contracts, but uh, uh, I worked with some folks that were contracting officers when I was in the Air Force. Yep. And they have this thing called contingency contracting. Mm -hmm. And that means that any duly authorized contracting officer in a contingency situation can write a contract that's legal and binding on any old piece of paper they can find. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and and then later on, make a new one. Right. But yeah, that would. So the uh, they always say the cocktail napkin yep. contract is better than nothing. 
Exactly. Well, and again, yeah. that's what that's what I try to tell people. As I say, yeah. well, you know, again, in that situation, we didn't. Again, ironically, of course, you had three lawyers, so you know, we could we should have been able to do it. But you right. don't need anything formal. You just need, you know, in a partnership agreement, you need who owns what, what everybody's responsibilities are, and who's. And what, I mean, if you what have are the that, equity shares, basically. Yeah. Right? What are the equity shares? And then you know, look, if you, as you get more complicated, then you probably want to, you know, you can either talk to a lawyer. You know, you could go into LegalZoom.com nowadays and get right. stuff pretty cheap. Right. Um. You know, at some point you'll want to deal with what happens if someone dies, if someone becomes disabled and, and all of those kind of bad contingencies. But mm-hmm. no, anything is better than nothing. Um, and, and so just having something in writing um, is beneficial because it, it sets out, you know, what your actual deal is. And so it gets everybody on the same page is the big issue. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lovely. But So let's talk a little bit about uh, me, because like I said before, I did... So what happened with me was like I was on podcast number two and I did some uh, paid training for, you know, getting better at podcasting. And -hmm. the guys nailed nailed home two points throughout the whole class was uh, you have to nail your audio. You have to sound really good. You have to sound basically like pro. And I was like, okay, I don't, but I know how I can. (laughs) And uh, and then and then the other thing was you have to nail your brand. And right. at that point, I was like, I don't even know what that means, right? What, is, what does that mean? I'm not Coca-Cola. I'm just this dude, Jeff, right? And, uh, and they're like, well, it's everything. It's everything that you want the show to mean, and it's like a concept. It's art. It's all this stuff. And I'm like, well, I don't know how to do any of that. So I end up paying some guys who are branding guys, right? Mm-hmm. And we hang out on Skype for like six weeks or eight weeks or whatever, and I pay them way too much money. And... um and we come up with the concept of the show and then they say, oh, by the way, you should do your IP too. Do you need help with that? Because we know a guy. And I'm like, what was it? Was that? <laughs> <laughs> What's IP? <laughs> I know what that is in computer speak, but I don't know right. what you're talking about. Right. Right. So, that, that doesn't really fit with what you're saying. You must be talking about something else there. Right. <laughs> exactly. It's not an address, right? With four periods in there. And they're like, no, <laughs> no, it's something else. So anyway, they, they decide, they talk me into doing a trademark for my logo and the name of my show. And then, we, we work on all of that. And I went through LegalZoom and it was, uh, it was long. And uh, surprisingly, you know, it was always like, oh, by the way, you owe us more money. <laughs> so so you, ke- you basically kept running into problems. I guess there were rejections and issues no, that had to be filed. No, 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 not so much that. It was just like I went through LegalZoom to get okay. a trademark, right? Right. Um, so there, there was that bill, right? And yep. then, and then I want to say there was at least. Mm, so I, when I first did my original filing, I hadn't even launched hadn't the started. show yet, right? Yep. yep. So, so I said I'm not using it yet, not knowing that later on <laughs> they're going to yep. charge me another fee to do this thing called a statement of use or something like that, right? <laughs> Well, and in, in legal zooms defense or whoever it was that you no, they're doing it right for. right yeah, yeah well and it's 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 most of that fee ends up just going to the government the government has right. a fee and you're, you're right, right. right so you can file you know the, the classic trademark is once you're using it and then you just file once file proof that you're using it and then you get your trademark well a, a lot of people file before they're using it and it's an intend to use um, right and okay. then Within six months, you have to then, after it's ultimately, you get what's called a notice of allowance. Within six months, you then have to prove that you're using it. And if you don't, you can pay to get an extension. So okay. You can pay the government, pay someone else to get a six-month extension. Right, right, right. You can keep doing that for a while, and then you ultimately have to show that you're using it and pay another fee. So it yeah. can get expensive. Um, right. And it's better it's, to know what you're doing to begin with. Or like you said, like I think if I did it again – I would wait to do the first filing after I had started using it, but I would have to do some sort of search to make sure I was clear. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. That's kind of why I wanted to do the, the 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 start it because it, they yeah. they were like, um, you want to be on record to be, like the first filed 
you know. Right. But it's right. not like, you know, it's not like any everybody was going to make a podcast called Vroom Vroom Veer. <laughs> <laughs> Right, yeah, and, right. And, and again, I mean, it's one of those things. So it's um, you can do a lot of things. I mean, it's it's always a balance. And if you're if you're by yourself, it's easy enough. But the big problem you'll face is if you start dealing with um, if you have people involved in your business who are marketing people and um, uh, PR people. Guess what? They're going to want you to trademark everything. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I you're right. That, so I, you know, I mentioned I mentioned that I, I brew beer. Well, and then I'm you know thought about that. I had literally I'd incorporated a business and I had some people working with me on it, and you know I you know came up with a slogan. Oh, you got to trade. You know, my PR guy and marketing. Oh, you got to trademark that. So I think I spent. I, you know, I probably spent two or three thousand dollars just filing initial trademarks. <laughs> right, on, right, right. And, and I'm like, wait a minute. You know, this was all coming out of my pocket because I was I was the pocketbook. In addition to being the, the the idea guy, and I'm like, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. I need to I need to put a hold on this because this slogan is not make or break. I could have gone without doing that one. Um, you know, y- your name I think matters. Yeah, um, right. You know, on that you can probably relax, and especially if you think about it with logos. I mean, what are the chances someone else is using the same logo as you? And that's probably not a big deal. You could probably right. change your look without too much difference. Right, right. I think that was more of me. Right. Because um, you had to do a separate filing if you wanted to do the name of the show. So I thought I could do uh, one trademark that included the logo and the name. <laughs> Nope. <laughs> to get nope. a little, uh, well, I know I didn't. They, <laughs> well, I know. Well, you, could, well, no, you could have. Right. But then someone else could have called their podcast "Broom Broom Beer" without my logo. Not using it without right. Logo. And, and, <laughs> right. And again, what what to, to help your listeners understand? Yeah. You get trademark rights by common law as soon as you start using it. Um, oh. Okay. There's there are val- there's value in having a registered mark and in, in a podcast world, it's actually an interesting thought experiment because. At common law, your rights generally have are limited by where you're using it. So let, let's use a classic example of a, a, a dry cleaner. Okay? okay, If I'm a dry cleaner in Washington, D.C., as soon as I open my business and start using my name, I will start to – I will have common law rights to trademark. Okay. The the problem is that's probably not going to expand outside of my immediate area because, you know, someone in in South Carolina is not them using the same name as me is not going to affect me one way or the other. Right. Getting a federally registered mark on the other hand, show you have to show that you are using the mark in interstate commerce or somehow related to interstate commerce. Right. But if you if you do that, you get nationwide protection. So right. then someone in South Carolina can't, can't get, use right. Can't use it. Yeah, and right, right. you know why I said in, in podcast world is interesting because it it it's an interesting experiment because you naturally are all over the world, or right. you know, at least all over the U.S. So That's right. w- maybe we're obtaining rights everywhere. Um, you probably were. I'd have to look at it and really think about it. Um, I don't know, but but I mean, uh, you know, yeah, because I mean, you think about a logo on iTunes or Stitcher or some yep. one of the places where podcasts show up. It's definitely nationwide. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I don't know like how said, it works with uh, international. I know I am international, but I don't think I have any protection because I didn't pay for yeah. any. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. again, it's it, what those are the types of questions and the types of issues of thinking about. Hey, is it worthwhile to file a trademark for things beyond my my brand name? You know, that's where you know talking to a lawyer is probably worthwhile because. They can help you get you give you a, a realistic perspective. At least if you trust your lawyer, that's the big problem. <laughs> right. There, there are a lot of lawyers out there who, quite honestly, I mean, you know, they're just trying to generate work for themselves. And and, and it's not just lawyers. You think of things you've probably seen um, various ads for in, invention help companies on TV, where you know, really, they're just trying to convince you to pay them to get a, a patent. Um, and they're not going to tell you that there's probably a ninety-five to ninety-eight percent chance you'll never see a dime from that patent, but you're going to spend. A lot of money. Yeah, you get your money. So, <laughs> right. Um, you know, and you have to be careful about that. But um, you know, a big part of my job is is helping people, in a sense, triage and figure out what should they be spent, where should they be spending their money, because I know they have limits. I mean, I have limits on what I can spend on my marketing and advertising budget, so I have to make wise decisions. I try to take the same approach um, in helping people think about where to spend their um, their legal dollars. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I thought, mm, you know, this is going to cost me upwards of something like 2000 I think, on LegalZoom. Oh. Probably more. I don't remember. <laughs> right? But I thought, you know, okay, 
it's probably more than I need to do, but if something happens, then I have, I, I, I can show use, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and again, I mean, the, the best part about it is if you have a federally registered trademark, and again, at some point after it's been federally registered for a certain period of time, you can get it designated or get it un, as uncontestable or incontestable. And so, oh, yeah. uh, you know, you can do things like that, which give you even more protection. Look, there are advantages of it. Um, if you have a federally registered mark, people are less likely to come after you. And again, if you're a startup, if you're a small entrepreneur or, you know, a fledgling business, quite honestly, if a big company comes after you, I, part of your decision has to be, can you even afford to defend yourself right. or do you just have to right. change it because right, right. they come after you? Yeah. And you know, if you have a federally registered mark, it'll help. It'll be easier. But, um, you know, it, it probably also, they can just outspend you essentially. Right. Right. But, yeah. you know, hope, hopefully by doing it. So if you, again, if it's a business that you're percolating on for a while, and this is why filing an intent to use trademark can be valuable. Mm. It will get published in a federal register and if someone doesn't challenge it, you, you can feel pretty good they're not going to come after you. Right. So I'd rather know now rather than yeah. you know after I've spent uh, money uh, building my brand and building my company. Right. Well said. Good good stuff. This has been fun. I, I we had we had some good stories. <laughs> I, I hope I hope your listeners learn something out of the deal. Oh yeah, for sure. If nothing else, you know, like uh, when to cut your hair, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to go be a lawyer, or look like a lawyer, maybe. That's right. <laughs> there you go. At least for a while. That's right. So you are Robert Bobby Clink, and you are at clinkllc.com. Yep. And uh, and uh, you've got a new book coming out, right? No, I've got – well, at some point, maybe I'll have another book coming out. I've got okay. a couple of books that are already out. Um, one of them, hopefully your listeners don't need. That's patent uh, litigation primer. So that helps you understand how a lawsuit involving a patent dispute uh, arises. So again, people only need that if they're in a bad spot. So gotcha. hopefully they don't. Um, the other one is the Entrepreneur's IP Planning Playbook. Mm, That's right. a book the book that helps people understand how to go through the process of creating a strategy. Again, it's, it's 75 pages. It, it maybe is more in depth than, you know, a fledgling, you know, solopreneur type of business needs, but it'll at least get you thinking about the right questions that you need to ask. Right. Um, both of those books, you know, they're available on Amazon if people want to buy them, but you know, I'm not going to make my living selling books about intellectual property. <laughs> right. So, so I give PDFs away for free at my website if people give me their email address. Oh, cool. Um, so they can do that. Um, I also have a, a free e-course. So I just a short e-course that people can take. Um, it's like a four, look at four emails on four subs or four successive days. Mm. Um, with a video uh, by me so you can see I don't actually look like a lawyer um, uh, <laughs> listening to me talk for about 10 to 15 minutes. You also get a free copy of the Entrepreneur's IP Planning Playbook and then three forms that you can use uh, to kind of go through the process. That is at uh, Clink LLC and we haven't spelled it. It's K-L-I-N-C-K. So com slash or forward slash podcast. Cool. And if you go there. You can sign up for that e-course for free. Yeah, and I'm going to put links to all of those uh, yeah. all those spots in the show notes. Okay, great. And, and if people want to follow me on Twitter, it's at Bobby Clink. I'm pretty active, uh, not just about law, mainly about entrepreneurship and mm. startups and, and advice. And then anytime I have a new blog post, you'll see it. So maybe there will be some valuable IP law um, I- insights that you can get out of the deal. Cool. Thanks, Bobby. This has been This has been a blast. It's been fun. Have a good one. Thanks, you too. Thanks for taking the time to ride along with us on another episode of Vroom Vroom Veer. For podcast info and show notes, be sure to head over to vvveer.com. That's triple V double E R.com. Man, that's fun to say. And we'll catch up with you next time here on Vroom Vroom Veer.